My name's Michael Hampel and I'm the presenter of Durham Cathedral and it's my pleasure and privilege to welcome you on your virtual pilgrimage to this holy place up here in the northeast, the final resting place of Saint Cuthbert, one of the great northern saints. And I'm beginning our pilgrimage here in the Galilee Chapel at the west end of Durham Cathedral because this is the final resting place of that other great northern saint, the Venerable Bede. Bede is the man who tells us the story about Cuthbert, so it's a good place to begin our pilgrimage and then we will ultimately arrive in the Shrine of St Cuthbert at the end of our time together. When St Cuthbert died in the year 687, he moved around the northeast to a certain extent and his shrine was established in other places first before arriving here in the year 995. And then a simple church was built as his shrine and then a greater stone church and then finally this great Norman cathedral begun in the year 1093 and completed in the year 1133. It became a very important centre of pilgrimage and the Benedictine community grew up and developed around the shrine and its influence is still very much present today in our daily life of prayer, mission and ministry. The cathedral has gone through many substantial changes in its time, not least of course the reformation of the 16th century but in the 17th century, it went through a dark time under the Republic of Oliver Cromwell when Scottish soldiers were imprisoned here in the cathedral and many of them died. These dark times are fortunately overwhelmed by the light of pilgrimage which has shone in this place over many years. This year was meant to be a year of pilgrimage for Durham Cathedral and although we very much hope to start that concept of modern day pilgrimage again later this year, at the moment we're having to make do with our online worship just like this virtual pilgrimage but I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. Today the Cathedral is a thriving community of people who are focused on prayer and pilgrimage, visiting, education and many other forms of engagement with the community of the North East and now of course through our online presence much wider all across the world. We've established a community of prayer and the members of that community can be found in every corner of the world as well of course as the North East. So as we begin our pilgrimage together, I want to encourage you to remember in your prayers with thanksgiving the Northern Saints, especially the Venerable Bede and St Cuthbert, but also to remember those of us who follow in their footsteps today in this holy place. And now let us pray. God our Maker, whose Son Jesus Christ gave to your servant Bede grace to drink in with joy the word that leads us to know you and to love you. In your goodness, grant that we also may come at length to you, the source of all wisdom, and stand before your face, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. I'm standing now at the west end of the nave of Durham Cathedral and you can see straight away the striking architecture of the Norman French man who came here in the late 11th century to build this place. Durham has an extraordinary sense of solidity and character, not least because it was the first building in this country with a completely stone vaulted ceiling and it gives it a sense not only of solidity but also of earthiness very much characteristic of the northeast of England where we're situated and yet there's also a great deal of gracefulness and elegance in the carvings of the stone those deep incisions 
in the pillars as you look eastwards up towards the high altar. Many people come here every day for prayer and worship. We gather every morning at 8.30 for morning prayer and every evening at 5.15 for evening prayer or choral evensong. Very similar in terms of rhythm to the Benedictine community of the cathedral's earliest days. But also there are many special acts of worship. There are pilgrimages on St Bede's Day and St Cuthbert's Day, but also other great acts of worship, more characteristic even of the North East, not least the Minas Festival service that takes place here on the same day as the big meeting, the Durham Minas Gala, where a great sense of connectedness to the North East is epitomised in the gathering here in the cathedral. The brass bands come through the north door and make their way proudly and resolutely up towards the front of the church, carrying the colliery banners from all over the northeast. It's a very, very important tradition and our connections with the local community are, of course, extremely important to everybody here at Durham Cathedral. Prayer and worship lie at the heart of what we do. In fact, we've recently been undertaking a process of change and restructuring at the cathedral, partly, of course, as a result of the difficulties that have arisen as a result of the pandemic. And in that programme of change, we've nevertheless shown that at the heart of everything we do is our prayer and worship, and that's as it should be. But of course, out from that programme of worship and prayer, which happens here every day, every week, there's also a great sense of engagement with other people who want to come here, who feel that the cathedral is theirs too. And that takes place in the form of pilgrimage, but it also takes place in those slightly earthier activities of sightseeing and passing through, coming to the shop and restaurant, all those good things that celebrate our common humanity with each other. But everybody who comes through our doors, we hope, will encounter some sense of the presence of God in Christ. And we're here to help them to do that, to help them make connections between themselves and their God. I'm standing now in the choir of Durham Cathedral and the choir of a cathedral church very much sits at the heart of our prayer life. This is where we would normally gather for morning prayer and evening prayer every day. Of course, that's been much more difficult over the last year as a result of the pandemic. And it's a great tragedy to think back to the beginning of lockdown and to remember that this choir fell silent for many months. The doors were shut and life felt very remote and bleak and difficult. However, from the word go, we began to live stream our daily acts of worship from our homes. One of my spare bedrooms became a little mini chapel, and I was very glad to be able to join together with our community in prayer each day. And some of us live streamed from our gardens with our dogs running around in the background. At one level, it was great fun, at another level, it was deeply prayerful because it reminded us that wherever we are, we are united in prayer in the presence of God. The live streaming led to the creation of the community of prayer, which I mentioned before. It's an online community, but it's very much rooted in the reality of the prayer life of this holy place. Nearly 400 people have signed up to it, and they've signed up also to a very simple rule of life, the kind of rule of life that has echoes, again, of the Benedictine tradition, which is so important here at Durham Cathedral. And then we were very glad when churches were able to reopen to real people coming into the church to join us for worship. 
That again, of course, became compromised in the second and third lockdowns, but the choir was able to return to its duties in September of last year. The choristers and the lay clerks and the choral scholars and the organists are very important leaders of worship here at Durham Cathedral. We have about 30 choristers and we have 12 adult singers and we have three organists at the moment and together they lead our daily services of choral evensong and a very rich programme of worship on a Sunday and of course they're very important players in our special acts of worship, some of which I mentioned earlier. So although the place is shut today and until it opens for private prayer later this morning, normally this choir where I'm standing would resound with the sound of choral music and organ music, but people have still been able to engage with that rich tradition which so much epitomises the English cathedral because of our online worship and the pre-recorded services that we've also been offering. And we hope that all of those things together, when life returns a bit more to normal, will encourage people to come to Durham Cathedral in person, to light a candle, to kneel in prayer, to come to choral evensong, and in all of those things, to be touched by the transforming presence of God in Christ. Beyond me, behind me, you can see the very elegant and beautiful Neville screen at the high altar. It was once, before the Reformation, covered in about 130 alabaster statues of saints. It must have been an extraordinary sight, but even though the saints have been removed from the altar piece, from the Neville screen, you can see how very beautiful it is it almost beckons you towards it to find out more. You want to go and examine its intricacy and look more closely at its beauty. And that's a very good thing because one of the other purposes of the Neville screen is that it is a kind of entrance to the shrine of St Cuthbert, where we'll go in a moment. It's beckoning you towards it because behind it lies as it were the goal of your pilgrimage to Durham Cathedral and the doors on either side of the shrine allow you to take yourself into the much more intimate and secluded space around St Cuthbert's Shrine, uh, bringing a greater sense I think of simplicity and humility to our time in Durham Cathedral and I think that's important because humility and simplicity very much epitomised the life of St Cuthbert himself. So we'll make that the goal of our pilgrimage and in a moment I'll take you into the shrine of St Cuthbert. But now I'm going to share with you a prayer that has been specially written for our online community of prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, in Christ you draw all people to yourself. Bless and guide our community, gathered from near and far. Make us instruments of your grace and signs of your dawning kingdom. Following the example of your servant Cuthbert, may we care for the lost through prayer and gather them daily into your presence. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And so here we are now in the shrine of St Cuthbert. You can see the great plain black slab of stone which covers his tomb and the words of his, the word of his name in Latin written on that slab, Cuthbertus, all very plain and simple, just like the man himself, but a man of great stature nevertheless, a man of great humility, but a man of great authority. He was Bishop of Lindisfarne in the 680s, a role he didn't look for, a role he didn't particularly want. 
He wanted a life of solitary prayer on the Farne Islands, and yet he was persuaded by king and church to become the Bishop of Lindisfarne, and there he was held in very high regard. And shortly after his death, the monastic community around him moved his body away from Lindisfarne because there were fears of incursions from uh, marauding uh, invaders to this country. And so he moved south and came closer to Durham. First of all, south of Durham itself in Ripon and then Chesterless Street and then Durham itself. He arrived here in 995 and this final church was started in 1093 and completed in 1133, as I said earlier. And straight away, it became a very important center for pilgrimage. Initially, there would have been a great, highly decorated edifice here in the shrine, holding the remains of the saint. But that was all taken away, of course, as you would expect in the 16th century at the time of the Reformation. But Cuthbert's remains stayed here, and that's a very, very important thing for Durham Cathedral when so many other shrines were completely desecrated and the bones of the saints were removed. But Cuthbert is still here, and he's still a focus for pilgrimage, and he still helps to root our prayers, both in the tradition of the past, but also with our aspirations for the future. People still come here in large numbers to say their prayers near St Cuthbert, and there are special occasions for example, St Cuthbert's Day itself on the 20th of March, when towards the end of our great service in the nave of the cathedral, we then encourage everyone, hundreds and hundreds of people, to make a pilgrimage here to the east end of the cathedral. Just behind me, behind the shrine itself, there is the very extensive, wide and large and deep chapel of the Nine Altars specially designed to hold pilgrims as they waited their turn to come into the shrine. And we still follow that kind of custom today, that concept of people gathering and then slowly making their way into the shrine to say their own prayers or to light a candle. We're looking very much to the future at the moment, even though we also feel very rooted in the past. We often talk about having one eye fixed on the past informing the other eye which is fixed on the future. And of course as we emerge from the difficulties of the last year of pandemic, this is very important indeed. And our aspirations are for more and more people to want to come to this cathedral church and indeed to become pilgrims and then perhaps also regular members of our community, either in person or online. The building up of the body of Christ is an important part of everything that we do. It lies at the heart indeed of what we do. And here in the Northeast, there is a great need at this time for a sense of God's presence, for a sense of God's healing touch, of his sustaining presence in Christ and for the movement of the Holy Spirit as we try to build up community and also to ensure that all people within our community and our local communities feel that they have opportunities which are good for them and good for each other. A sense of sharing in the good things that earth affords, the good things that God has given us. There are many difficulties uh, in people's individual lives and in the lives of communities, as we all know. And we need healing and we need building up and we need Christ's body to be the shape and the sense of purpose for our communities and that's important to us in the northeast so i hope that the day will come when you too will make a pilgrimage in person to durham cathedral you will of course be very very welcome so let us fall silent now and offer our prayers to god 
and I will pray with you the collect for St Cuthbert's Day. So we lay at the altar of God both our anxieties and our fears, but also our thanks for the many blessings that we receive in our lives. We give thanks for St Cuthbert and for all the Northern Saints, and we pray that we may follow in their footsteps as we make our pilgrimage closer and closer to God with deeper and deeper faith. Loving Father, whom the whole company of the saints adore, we rejoice with all our hearts in Cuthbert, glory of our sanctuary and ever-living symbol of our apostleship. Help us to follow his example by the simplicity of our lives and by the power of our witness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. Thank you very much indeed for joining me in this virtual pilgrimage to Durham Cathedral. I've enjoyed being able to talk to you and I want to assure you of the prayers and blessings of Durham Cathedral community for each and every one of you. As I said before, do please consider coming to Durham Cathedral and visiting us. And if you do, come and tell us about yourselves. Tell us that you saw the virtual pilgrimage and that you've made your own pilgrimage and we'll offer you God's blessing.